you're on. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Joe and Black Ministries. I'm Father Joe Cup, and you are not in today. It's Friday, April 12th, I think, the year of our Lord, 2024. And I'm so glad we're all here today for our question and answer. We've got a load of questions loaded up, so don't let that stop you. If you have questions, just reply to this video on X with your questions or on Facebook, or uh, you can do smoke signals. But I want to be clear, it's very windy, and we don't know how to read those. <laughs> if you're wondering, what is up with the sparkly background? <laughs> That's actually my personal holy. <laughs> no, uh, I am at our parish hall, and I wish you could see it. I've been here five years. This is the best this hall's ever looked, right? I always hate it, Carrie. It, it feels dark and dark in here. It's inside brick, so in a very low ceiling. And somehow... Anne and, and her volunteers at the school have transformed this space into something stunning. And this is part of it. Although I told Carrie, it looks like I'm in a 70s children's show. Like, if it you does. saw this behind me without this box, you would think, that looks sweet. But when you put it on this little box of the camera with me, I feel like, welcome to the kids' show. Uh, 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 uh. But we're not going to get into that. Captain Kangaroo will be here Captain any minute. Kangaroo and Mr. Green here. Who remembers Mr. Green being here? Yeah. So, uh, what were we talking about? Oh, because this is our school auction tonight. It is a huge event, and we would love your help. This is how we help our kids. Um, so, in the words of St. Jerry Maguire, help us help you. How was that? That was, that was spot on. Well, you know. Uh, let's give a big welcome to our foreign correspondents, Patricia in Scotland. Uh, Bren Van in Canada, Sabine in Germany. We're talking about Germany tonight. Did you see that question? Yes, I did. Uh, Richard in England, Margaret in New Zealand, and Chris in the Philippines. We're so happy to have our foreign correspondents. If you're listening from a country that isn't America or one of these, let us know, and you will be named our foreign correspondent in that country. And here's the best part. You could lie. We'd believe you. How would we know? <laughs> I mean, sure, we sell your IP addresses to the NSA, but who doesn't? I also want to say uh, hello and howdy hi buckaroos and buckettes to Michigan Church Supply in Mount Morris, Michigan and Celtic Cove Catholic Bookstore in Oxford. Buy local stuff. This is a command from God. Remember he said, love God and love neighbor and buy local. Buy local. Also, of course I have to say hi to Kyle at Grand Blank Al Sarah. If you are going to buy a car and you're within 350 miles of Grand Blank, you should go to Kyle. If you don't, no offense, but please stop going to Mimi. So uh, throughout our show today, I'll not only be answering your questions with stunning intellect, alarming alacrity, and devastatingly accurate theology and astounding humility, I'll also be talking to you about our auction tonight in case you love God and want to help. Uh, no pressure. I mean, some of you hate God. I get it. Uh, but if you want to help, can we put up our little link? Uh, are we going to do that? I don't know. Yes. Yeah. We're going to put up the Big Pal one. Uh, it's, okay, here's, here's another bit. Six, six, six. I'm just kidding. That, wouldn't that be crazy if that was all of us? Okay. okay. So while that's going on, <coughs> we're going to load up the code. Uh, and, and I've got questions here, so let's get after them. The first one's kind of funny. It says, regarding today's gospel... The feeding of the with the loaves and fishes. Mm -hmm. Where do they get all the baskets to collect the food? Uh, that's kind of a funny question, and I dig it. Think of baskets back then, like backpacks, purses, wallets. Now, everybody had a basket that they carried things around in from A to B. Things they needed. This wasn't like, oh, I gotta get my makeup uh, because um, well, people did wear makeup actually, but not so much to do. Um, in fact. Oh, did, did our signal poop out? Are we still going? Because you can call me butter. Roll. No? We're just going to let that go? What's going on? Now it's working. Did they get any of what I said? <laughs> they heard it from afar. They heard it from afar? I don't know, like Jamie Farr from MASH? <laughs> yeah. So I do I know. start all over? Right, <laughs> right now, D-Bear, 
Die Bear? Yeah, I love her. Okay. She thinks she's funny. Oh, she is very funny. <laughs> Seriously, that chick is nuts. Uh, uh, I got to meet her here, and I think she and I could get in a lot of trouble. I do. Um, but do I just start all over? Do you want me to start no, all over? Just do it. I mean, they heard a little bit of it, but, you know, you can do a sweep. Okay, so, uh, Hi. I am a delicate flower in the garden of the Lord. And uh, let's see, what did I talk about? I talked about the fact that we're at the auction. This is why you have sparkly things behind me. It's not a 70s children TV show. And if the camera pulled back and you saw the whole thing, it'll look cool. But when I looked at the screen here that I'm looking at right now, my God, I'm pretty. And I see this behind me. Doesn't it look like that? Like as cool as that looks as a whole, when you got it on the little screen, it looks like, hi, kids. <coughs> Sorry, got to quit smoking crack. So um, we're here at the school auction. This is how we fund our school. And our hope is that everybody watching, if you want, participate, help out. We've got some cool items. And what I'll do as I answer your questions is I will uh, like maybe showcase some of the items that we're auctioning off. Um, if you want, one way we have figured out, and this is really cool. Anne is very good at this. She figured out a way to make sure you get the item you want. And this was amazing. Bid $9 million. We can basically guarantee you will get the item. And if we don't, if you don't, if you bid $9 million and don't get it, we will give you a $5 coupon for McDonald's. Yeah. Okay. And say in four. So all kidding aside, I'll describe some of the auction items up. And uh, just as we go through and see if you want to participate. But until then, let's start looking at people's questions that they submitted. If you have questions, you can submit them right here on X under this thing or whatever this is. Or if you're on Facebook, you can submit them through the comments or a private message to uh, the Pope. The question, the first question is regarding today's gospel, the feeding of the loaves and fishes, where did they get all the baskets to collect the food? That is a funny question, and I kind of dig it. Uh, but here's the key. Everybody had a basket. It's how you carried things. Nobody had purses or wallets or SUVs. Um, although it would be funny if every once in a while they got like a donkey that was super big and they like, that's our SUV. That's the, the donkey. That's how they say it in Scotland. The donkey. Uh, so, <clears throat> people, everybody would have had a basket just about. Because <clears throat> um, that's how they carried stuff. Their car keys. Next, is there a special form of absolution for soldiers who take, uh, take an oath to protect their country and have to take the life of another person? Uh, no, that's uh, not a sin, right? If you're a soldier and you are... Uh, fighting, uh, you know, fulfilling your vow as a soldier, as long as you're not following an immoral order, killing is tragically part of the job, right? That's, uh, it's, it's tough. Now, if you feel the need to confess it, well, of course confess it. But there's no special absolution. There's one absolution, huh? And again, part of being a soldier is the possibility of being justly ordered to take someone's life. Um, and obviously that's a tragedy for that person and their family, but it's part of your duty. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I remember seeing an interview with uh, Lee Child, who wrote all those Jack Reacher books. And he said a funny thing. He talked about how one of his goals, he said, I was going to write a book like everyone else's, where the hero is an army ranger or a Navy SEAL or something. And kind of, it's a Kung Fu type story, right? Where he just wanders the earth solving problems. Uh, but what he said was he was meeting with a group of army rangers and they were pretty beat up. And he was like, what happened? And the long and short of it is he found out an MP beat their butts and he he was just shocked as he interviewed these guys he found out you know when you get mps he said every group of mps has that one guy who's just psycho and goes in and it's his job to break up fights between seals and rangers or delta or whatever he said they're the most dangerous people in the army uh and and he, he really got a kick out of that so he wrote a character who was a, an mp a lifer who retired and now wanders the country and solves crimes. I can't remember why I'm telling you that. Oh yeah, because one of the lines in there, uh, in the interview, he said, 
you know, when he interviewed MPs, when they did murder investigations, they said the toughest part of our job is that every suspect is a trained killer, which I never thought of. He said everybody in the Army is a trained killer. They have to be. And uh, I don't know. I just thought that was a perspective I hadn't thought of. Okay, next, why is the organ not used at Mass? Well, it depends on the church. Like in our case, it's because it's not hooked up. We uh, had to tear down the old church. The pillars supporting it had rotted out. And we built a new church. But moving organ pipes is quite expensive. And it's very hard to find a company that'll do it. There's only a couple companies in the whole country that maintain and move organs. So in our case... Uh, our new organ, or are not our old organ pipes, are going to be put back in their proper place in January of 25. That took us three years to set up. Yeah, we signed the contract a while ago, but their first shot is January of 25. Isn't that crazy? You know, they're in an industry where there's just not a lot of people doing what they do. Uh, so at our church, just because we haven't got the organ pipes moved. We finally raised the money-ish, I think. I mean, we have the money, right, sis? But we're working on, you know, we'll always take donations. Uh, so for our church, other churches, I don't know why. Uh, I was at one church where I talked to the pastor, and it was funny. They did what they did at Holy Family. They put the organ pipes right at the altar, like, if, if you walked into church and you didn't know Catholicism, you would have assumed we were worshiping organ pipes. Seriously. Yeah. You couldn't see the tabernacle. You couldn't see anything but nine billion organ pipes. And then when you prayed up there as the priest, it was pounding. Like if I had hair, it would have parted my hair and back and blew out my hearing aids. I don't know if you remember, my first year and a half, I didn't wear hearing aids at Mass because it would set them off. Right. So I met a priest one time where he took over a church where the organ pipes, you remember I told you about this, were right. I mean, and not just behind the priest, but at like at head level. And he said, every priest who prayed mass here got headaches just because the organ was bam, you know, just beat in the back of your head. So I don't know. There could be any number of reasons. If it's our church, it's because we're waiting to get them installed and they will not be directly behind the priest. Uh, <laughs> At some churches, uh, yeah, and plus, here's a mistake a lot of people make. The ability to play piano doesn't mean you can play organ. And there are, at some churches, people who play organ, but they kind of are piano players who sort of figured it out, and that doesn't tend to go well. Uh, to play an organ requires a tremendous amount of training. Um, it's a big deal. Like, one of the things that blew me away is like at one church I was at, the music was so slow, I prayed for God to kill me. And it was because the organ player wasn't trained. So, and I didn't know this, you have to be a little ahead of everybody. Like what they're hearing and what God's people are hearing are two different things. This is why you never let music people touch the sound system. <laughs> <laughs> right? Seriously. Right? Because they think, oh, I know music. You don't know sound. And what you hear is different when the people over there hear. Right? And it's the same with organs. So this person was playing to, oh, anyway. How are we talking about this? Uh, somebody asked, in Isaiah 6, 6, a seraphim, quote, flew him, it says. Uh, there are many parts of the New Testament where Jesus walked through the crowd or disappeared. After his resurrection, he appeared and disappeared from rooms. Do you think when we are resurrected, we will be able to teleport anywhere in the universe? Teleport would probably not be the best theological term. Uh, but absolutely, you will be able, you will be um, restored, what does the church call it, to your preternatural state. You'll only be able to be one place at a time, but you'll be able to get anywhere instantly. You'll be able to be corporeal or incorporeal at will. Um, yeah, so what you saw Jesus, what, not saw, if you did, let us know. Uh, when you read about Jesus appearing to the disciples post-resurrection, that's how you'll be uh, at the end of the world, right? Because don't forget, 
when we die now, our bodies go in the ground and our souls go to judgment. When Jesus returns, he will raise up our mortal bodies, restore them, and then restore them to our soul, and we will be body and soul in the new Jerusalem, the new universe, the remade, the redeemed. Yeah. Does that? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. We have... Oh, you want me to go look at an auction item? I am going to put my glasses on. Yep. Oh, sorry about this, folks. Well, it's not going to show you. We're okay. now showing the friends on the terrace there. If Ooh, you want to talk about that. I think that'll be lovely. Okay, this is item number 300 on your auction thing. And did you give them a link how to get there? Yes. Okay, so if you want to bid on this, the recommended starting bid is $18 million. Uh, just no pressure, but Bill Gates, if you're watching, yes, please. Uh, with... Last year we tried this and it really worked. So what I'm doing is hosting an exclusive gathering at the Holy Family Terrace. It's this beautiful outside area with Roman tents and all sorts of wonderful setup. Uh, it'll be on June 14th of 2024 from 5 to 8 p.m. We will have great food and spirits and cigars for Jesus. Uh, this Im lit event is limited to 50 couples and it will provide us the opportunity to deposit $12,500 into our school endowment. So we've only sold a couple tickets so far. We just put this up. Uh, each ticket entry, each ticket is entry for two people. You got me? Yep. So if you buy a ticket, it's really two tickets. And they're priced at $250. So uh, once you pick, pick it, the churches, once you purchase the ticket, did you hear that? I did. What the heck? And I'm in charge. I'm in charge of two parishes and a school. Uh, once you purchase your ticket, we have a record of your attendance. You don't need to pick up a ticket or anything like that. So if you're interested in this event, it's called Friends on the Terrace. It's Friday, June 14th, the year of our Lord, 2024. Now, if the world ends on the 13th, we will refund your money. No, uh, we are not going to refund your money if the world ends. We're going to hoard it in the kingdom of heaven. And when we see you, we'll be like, yeah, you paid money and didn't get it. <laughs> right? I mean, just like Jesus did. So if you're interested, uh, go ahead and purchase one of those tickets, and that gets you two entries into the Friends of the Terrace event from 5 to 8 on June 14th. Um, and all proceeds from this, by the way, are to help our school. Right? There, there's no, what do you say, sis, profit margin? You know, there's no, it's just if we make money, where we make money goes into the school. Right. The one on the terrace is my specific attempt to build up our endowment, right? So that uh, we can reduce tuition. Right now, at Holy Family, we charge almost $2,000, well, about $2,000 less than the cost to educate, right? And how do we make that up? Well, the people of God at our church make it up through the collection. Uh, the other way is through these fundraisers. We have 50 of them a year. I'm just kidding. Wouldn't that be hilarious? Poor Anne. We would, you would be like on oxygen. If we, Anne, we're going to have 50 fundraisers this year. God's people won't mind. Um, okay. So somebody said, uh, I hesitate to mention this. I already like this one. Is that okay to say? Uh, but yesterday on social media, they were, there were a lot of people who were sure where O.J. Simpson's soul was. I actually know. It's in Jersey. <laughs> yeah, don't tell anybody. Some even took glee in the idea that he was getting justice. I have no idea whether O.J. sought absolution. He didn't appear to have remorse, but if he did, then I must leave that up to God. What are your thoughts? Um, anonymous social media is the worst element of American culture, I think, in many ways. Uh, and why? Because I've posted stupid things and got sometimes lovingly, sometimes not so much, called out for it. When it's, you know, Papal Dragon Slayer 7235, you can say anything you want. It require, it, this is why I can't stand anonymous accounts in this regard. If you're in an anonymous account that's just there kind of cheering things along, great. If you're in an anonymous account that's expressing strong opinions, then I think you're a coward, right? I do. I really do. Um, if, if you're out there fighting uh, and, and mixing it up every day and no one knows your real name, you're, you're a coward. Well, my job's in jeopardy. Well, then shut your mouth. Yeah, those are your choices. 
right? And every other world, except, you know, oh, don't get into it. Except social media, we're held accountable to what we say. And if you don't want to be accountable, well, then you're a coward. But on social media, we justify it. Um, you're either willing to put your name behind your opinion or you're not. And if you're not, your opinion means nothing. Nothing at all. Uh, except that you're not very brave. With that, O.J. Simpson is dead. And I don't know where he is. And neither does anyone else. And everyone who says something gleeful about his death will answer to God for that. Whether he's guilty or not, God's wish is that we're all saved. And we have no idea what went through his mind or heart. None at all. Only God does. So this is the trouble to me with much of Catholic-ish social media. Is It's a very tiny segment of the Catholic population. It's minute but all the strongly opinionated people seem to be congregating there. So it gives us a false sense of reality. Um, it's like, did you see this? Jeff sent me an article from Axios. And I was astounded. I'm going to find the actual data. Okay. In fact, I think I'm going to do it right now. But this will blow you away. What the author was pointing out was they did a ton of, um, what do you call them? Uh, polls, okay, to look at uh, how do Americans feel about something. So how do Republicans feel about this? How do Democrats feel about that? And in the end, what their goal was, was to see how in unity are we as a country, right? When everybody is talking about there is going to be a civil war. So what this thing pointed out, for example, let's look at this. They interviewed a ton of U.S. adults, okay? So they said, we're going to name an issue. You tell us if it's extremely or very important, if it's somewhat important, or if it's not important at all. So let's look at the craziest one. The right to keep and bear arms. Okay? 54% of people uh, say that that is extremely or very important. 24% say it's very important. Okay. Now, if you get down, what is the Democrat-Republican split on that? 50-50. You would never know that from social media. Okay. Let's look at uh, how important is um, freedom of religion. Well, I'm, we're all on the same page there. Uh, how about freedom, uh, the right to assemble peaceably? 83% say it's extremely or, or very important. Now, what percentage are Republican and Democrat? 50-50. Right, that we're told things are awful, and it's because it's the awful people talking. Uh, in the meantime, there's a whole ton of sane people trying to have rational discussions and figure things out, they're just not on the internet. Y you get me? So, most Americans, I would assume, heard he died and made jo no judgments about where he's at, took no glee in the possibility of hell, and simply moved on with their day. Um, so th there you go, right? Uh, anybody who takes glee in someone else getting justice needs to be conscious of this. Justice puts you in hell, right? A judgment, justice puts me in hell. There's a standard for heaven. I cannot meet it. Jesus can. So if we do justice, I go to hell. And anybody who celebrates somebody potentially burning in hell is putting themselves in danger of hell. Because you're stepping away from the heart of God. Yeah? Um, okay, someone asked, when does the Easter duty, <laughs> yeah, you said duty, for receiving communion start? I've read beginning of Lent, others say Triduum or Easter Vigil or Easter Sunday to Pentecost. I honestly have no idea. Isn't that funny? I always just assume Easter duty was Easter Day, right? Uh, Easter Vigil to the last Mass on Easter Day. So, I can't tell you that. I can make up an answer and sound very confident, ready? In the document written by Pope Eusebius the 18th called Le Schleble, I don't know. <laughs> Go on Easter or Easter Vigil, right? This is what Jesus wants. I just checked with him. He says hi, by the way. Okay, I have a question about that. Yeah. So when you they say receiving communion, I mean, it's but it's every Sunday. 
Yeah, I mean, you want to go to, you want to receive communion every day that you can, uh, quite literally, right? I know this sounds funny, but spiritually think of it this way. Do I have to get a million dollars today or can I just do it once a year? Right? That spiritually, there is nothing more potent than the Eucharist. And that's always the other bishop. Uh, uh, what's his name? Deacon Sean Costello pointed this out one time, and I laughed my butt off. He said, if you put a sign outside of the church and said free hamburgers, you'd get more people. But if you put a sign out there that says free Eucharist, you get less. Uh, we're body obsessed people, right? Uh, we forget we're a body soul unity. Body is loud, soul is quiet. We're loud people, body wins, right? So try to think of it this way. How often should I receive communion uh, every day? That's the goal. Think of it like your soul getting a million bucks. How often would you like to receive that million bucks? Yeah? Um, yeah, what do you think? I think that's good. And I have a follow-up to that. See, si. that's Spanish. Mm -hmm. Right there, on that topic. On that topic, I went to Easter Vigil. I went to Easter Mass, and I received communion both times after I read that I was not supposed to do that. Is that true? No, it's not true. Um, here's the key. Here's when you should refrain from receiving communion more than once a day if you're doing it because you think it does more good. Yeah? Give us this day our daily bread. So today we buried Joe Dunn, 101 years old, Superman. He loved our school. He loved our parish. Uh, did you see his obit? It doesn't say he went to Holy Family. He served Holy Family. And I'm like, dang. Like on my bio, or on my obit, I'd want Holy Family served to Joe. <laughs> I think that's very... <laughs> Anne just threw up in her mouth. Um, what were we talking about? Something with Jesus and God. Oh, uh, so there were people who went to our 8 a.m. this morning and received communion. And then they were at Joe Dunn's funeral and received communion. Excellent. Right, uh, your goal isn't well. I'm gonna go again so I can get more grace. It doesn't work that way, right? It's not money. Uh, one receiving communion once in the day is sufficient. But if you're at Easter Vigil and you're like, well, I want to experience Easter Sunday too. Yeah, rock on with your bad self and receive communion at both. You know? Yeah. Oops, Anne's giving me a look. I'm getting a mom look. I'm getting a mom look. I, you know, we both have headphones on, and she doesn't, so I can't hear anything oh, she says. Oh, I got you. And I would take my headphones off, but, but I don't have my hearing she, aids in. You'll have to type it on the uh, Oh, can you doc. do that, sis? Okay, so <laughs> Anne's got a question. Uh, in the meantime, we don't have a picture for this one, so we'll stay on you. Okay, so I'm going to put but my glasses on. we have one more. All one right, let's about. take a look at another one. Which one? Ooh, are you serious? We're going we're gonna to do that, yeah. right? Okay, so where did it go? Uh, right there at the top, 302. Oh, nice. Okay, so... Uh, item number 302 yep. is our grand blank homecoming tailgate at Holy Family. What does this mean? Seriously, primo parking. Like, if you underhand throw a baseball, it will land on the football field. Yes. That's how close you're parking. I mean, it is right. You cross the road and you're in the end zone, right? Which, by the way, the police have asked me to stop doing. Uh, it is a prime parking spot. And walking distance to the game, and here's what's included. You get four parking spots. You get the Enzo's catering package for 20. Not 19. 20. Or two priests. Right? <laughs> 20 people or two fat priests. Uh, and you have access to our restrooms for a reasonable fee. Um, I'm just kidding. I'm kidding. It's not reasonable. Uh, but all kidding aside, you can make a bid right now on item 302 for the Holy Family tailgating package, and you'll have four primo spots for the homecoming game. You'll have uh, a catering package from Enzo's, the greatest pizza place in Grand Blank, for 20 people, and obviously you have access to our uh, bathrooms. Yep, we'll throw in a cooler full of water and pop. Yeah, yeah, and that's a great idea. It's all on September 27th. Okay, so this is going to happen on September 27th. We'll provide the water and the pop. A whole cooler full of it. And if you're really lucky, I'll dance. So check that one out, too. So, so far, we've got item 300, which is friends on the terrace, right? $250 gets two people in, and we'll have a lovely night together with cocktails and food and cigars. 
uh, and that's on June 14th. Item 302 is the tailgating package for uh, the Grand Blank Homecoming. I, uh, these are good items. They're excellent I'm, items. And yeah. the Friends on the Terrace, I dare say, is the one time people will see you in the wild. Yeah. Yeah, you'll see me out in the wild. Now, if you stop me and try to tell me all your troubles, I will flee. <laughs> I just want to be really clear about that. You have 99 other friends you can talk to that night. That's right. That's right. <laughs> so, uh, okay. Um, is uh, Let me see. La, la, la. My high school student is going to be... T oh, wait. We already covered that, didn't we? Yes, yes. Uh, hi, Father Joe. What is the name of the church in Rome that is your favorite? I think you mentioned it on the show. Okay, believe it or not, that's actually a complicated question. Okay? So there's a few answers here. Stick with me. Uh, first of all, my personal favorite is not one of the seven great basilicas. The one I would, like, go sit in all day and die happy is Our Lady of Perpetual Help. If you can find that church in Rome, I found it by accident. It's just a little church. Um, it's hard to explain how beautiful that church is to me. And what's interesting is when I visited it in 2017, uh, I journal. And I journaled about the sense that the Lord had something different for me in the future. And I didn't know what it was. And, uh, and I wrote even about St. Mark, the gospel writer. And a year later, I was assigned to St. Mark and Holy Family. And that meant something to me. Right around the same time, almost exactly a year later. Beyond that, uh, the one that has tremendous emotional value for me is the Basilica of John Lateran. Okay? So people will say St. John Lateran. It's not St. John Lateran. It's just John Lateran. There's no St. John Lateran. Uh, but Lateran is the name of the family that donated it to the pre-Christian Romans, and it was a barrack place, and blah, blah, blah. But the reason I love that one was it was my mom's favorite. And what makes that one off the hook is there are monster statues of the apostles. And the marble carving is so detailed, it will rip your heart out. Like, it, there's one with St. Bartholomew who was skinned alive. He's holding his skin out. And it looks, uh, boom, okay, it will melt your face. And what's cool about that one, too, is right across the roads are St. Helena's steps. So the steps that they drag Jesus up to go before Pilate. You can walk up those steps, right? Uh, St. Paul outside the wall is one I dig for its historicity and just because I like that style of church. Um, ask me what it's called. What is it called? I have no idea. Uh, but architects... Saint, I have and, no idea. Yeah, Saint, I have no idea. But people who know art and architecture will know whatever style of church that is. But there's something about it, it's just a stunner. And uh, so those are my three favorites. I probably told you John Ladron. Um, but Our Lady of Perpetual Help, it's just this tiny little church right in the heart of Rome. Uh, I have great emotional value too. And, um, and then, uh, focus. St. Paul on the Wall is just groovy. If you ask me, it's just groovy. I, I love that place. Um, so when does a Catholic pick a president? Oh, how does a Catholic, oh gosh, okay. You're just mean for asking this question. <laughs> I'm serious. Because here's the thing. Uh, we've completely lost our minds. And and I love us all. I love us, love us, love us. And the people who know me are so sick of me saying this. But uh, I don't think, it is my personal opinion, that a Catholic really can't morally endorse either of these people. Um, and any priest who gets up and tells you, you can't vote for a candidate who actively works in favor of abortion is telling you the truth, but they're telling you some of the truth. Uh, in a two party system, they're telling you who to vote for and they can cloak it and all the cute little language they want. I have never in my life, I'm 54, voted for, to my knowledge, a candidate for office that worked in favor of abortion. I just won't. But it also means that in a two-party system, I won't put up with them putting, say, a serial adulterer up who was pro-choice his whole life until being 
pro-life gets you elected, theoretically, and who um, now, is, I think just yesterday, was saying uh, the pro-lifers are ruining the party. It's the third time he said this. Um, yeah, what do you do? You pray your heart out. Don't talk to anybody about it because everybody's completely insane. And do what your well-formed conscience tells you. Me, I vote third party. Right. And again, people, oh, you're you're wasting a vote. No, you're wasting a vote voting for people who are awful and they have no respect for you. A system that has respect for you doesn't run Biden Trump part two. Uh, And the only way they're going to respect us is if we tell them no, Uh, but still vote. So that's my personal opinion. It has very little value. Uh, I could be way off. I've been wrong more than I have it. What I will tell you is if a priest gets up there and tells you you can't vote for one person, they're telling you to vote for another. And they're using God's worship, a time when we are there to worship God. They're using that time to tell you who to vote for. And that's a sin, if you ask me. Yeah. I'm no help on this question. No, yeah, absolutely. Okay. Uh, what do priests do when traveling on vacation for attending Mass? Do they let the church know ahead? Do you introduce yourself to the priest when you arrive, slide into the pew like the laity and exit like a crime scene? Yeah, I, I kind of any of these. Me, uh, I take a Mass kit with me, and I just pray Mass wherever I am. Um, the problem now, if you could leave that up just for another sec. Yeah. Okay, sorry, sis. The problem most priests have run into is, you may remember, in 2001, the crisis really exploded about priests committing crimes against minors, right? Sexual crimes against minors. And uh, it blew up. And the result was our bishops all went down to Dallas, right, uh, to have this giant meeting. Like, what are we going to do? And what they decided, like there were a lot of options. One, we could discipline the bishops who knew these men were predators and kept moving them. They did not do that. They said, they, they could have said, well, let's come up with a, a way to respond to charges against priests so that we react appropriately and equitably. But that seemed like a lot of work to them. So in the end, what they did was say, I know, let's make sure every lay person who ever works in church has to take a course called Virtus. And while they were telling you, God's people, and rightly so, less than 3% of priests who've ever lived in this country have ever been accused of a, calf, of a sexual crime, while they were telling you that, they were setting up a system where now, if I want to pray Mass 20 minutes that way in the Archdiocese of Detroit, I have to call my bishop's office, who then calls their bishop's office, and then I get a letter that says, Joe is a priest in good standing, and get this, the the last paragraph, as far as we know, (laughs) he's safe around children. It is the worst, most dehumanizing uh, piece of, let's throw priests under a bus to mitigate liability baloney you've ever encountered. Uh, But it's what they did. And most of those bishops are gone now. Praise the Lord. Uh, and excuse me for getting so, but it's it's dehumanizing. Can you imagine that you're, uh, I don't know, uh, and you work in fundraising. And can you imagine you're going to go somewhere to fundraise, right, to help some good people because you care. And you have to carry a letter that says, I don't hurt kids. Right? Uh, what the hey is this? Uh Anyway, it's what they did. So if I'm anywhere and I want to pray Mass in public and it is not the Diocese of Lansing, there has to be a whole process of Joe safe um, and Joe is a priest in good standing. So if I go to another diocese and I don't have my Mass kit, I tend to slide into the pew. Yeah, but I carry my Mass kit everywhere because I hate bad homilies. Is that awful? Not at all. I dare say. Is this terrible? I think this is fair to say. Most priests are not good preachers. Now, I don't know what percentage are bad. But, yeah. (laughs) Is that awful to say? 
I don't know. Like, and I don't, I don't mean it's, it's not their fault. I. The church pretends if you have a call to be a priest, that means you're a great preacher, or that means you're supposed to be a pastor, and it's ludicrous. Right. I, I mean, I think we, everybody out there with me, <clears throat> can agree it's not a secret. Yeah. Some of yeah. them are. Some of them aren't. And there's no real system, right? So I've worked with priests who are terrible preachers. And usually the biggest problem is they can't land the plane, right? They give their homily, and they start to circle the airport, right? And then they're like, abort, abort, and they take off again. And it's like, no, no, land the plane, land the plane. Um, yeah. Uh, yes. The call to priesthood at some point, I'm going to cough. At some point, the church will theoretically figure this out. The call to priesthood is the call to priesthood. It doesn't mean you're a pastor. It doesn't mean you'll ever be a good pastor. So why do that to God's people? It doesn't mean you're a good preacher. Why do that to God's people? It doesn't mean you're going to be good in the confessional. Why do that to God's people? And the church used to have these things called simplex, right? Which was, okay, Joe, you're ordained you can hear confessions and preach, but Jesus helped the day we put you in charge of a parish, right? Or, Johnson, you're a heck of an administrator, priest, but when you're in the confessional, you yell at people and your homilies suck, so you can't preach or hear confessions, right? These are the kind of things they used to do when we had an abundance of priests. What cracks me up, is, and this is just my opinion, right? I have no, I have no, uh, to me, now that numbers are so bad, we should get more picky. Right? We should. Uh, we should get more picky so that people's experience of priests is us being priests and doing what we're good at, not plugging holes. Right? The system now plugs holes. Am I making sense? Yes. Okay. How did I get into this? So there's a, there's a follow-up question okay. to the uh, attending Mass uh, while you're on vacation. If you are with family, can they participate in the Mass with you and your kit? With me, I don't have a when family, Carrie. My wife, um, well, that's a secret. Okay, wait, so say it again. So when you do go on vacation with your mass kit, yeah. and family, you're with family, can yeah. they participate in the mass? Yeah. Like, one time, and I, this, I did get in trouble for this, and I get it, but I didn't know what to do, okay? I was on vacation with some of my fam, and we were in one of those places, we were in the tropics, do you say the tropics like Caribbean? Is that tropics? Hey, I don't know. if there was a palm tree, it's tropical. My sis. So in the morning, I went up, set up my little mass kit, and I prayed a mass with my fam. Turns out the whole freaking world was Catholic in this little complex. There were 80 people the next day. Hey, are you having mass again? Can you? And I'm like, I'm not going to say no. You know, and so they just loved it so much. Literally by the fifth day. I had went to the local parish and got 200 hosts, right? And I told him, if you want, I'll take up a collection and give you guys the money, right? I, d I don't need money. Uh, well, I mean, you know, I, I'm not doing this for money. You might need money. And these are rich white people, right, uh, on a very poor island. So in the end, somebody posted a picture of me praying mass in a courtyard with probably 200 people. I am not kidding. And they were just touched by it. And then somebody sent that to my bishop, and then I got a call, did you get permission? And I didn't get permission, and blah, 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 blah. And I got the no, e no, e praised talk. Wow. Yeah. This, there's a follow-up kind of to that now. Okay, groovy. Let her rip. Well, it's not, it was a separate question. Okay. But Somebody just submitted today. They want to know why you cannot have a Catholic wedding outside of the church building. Oh, because you're a huge sinner. No offense. No, I'm just kidding. Why can't we have a Catholic wedding outside of a church? Uh, you know what's funny? I have this written down somewhere. I do. Oh. But here's what I can remember, okay? Um, <clears throat> the rules are that a wedding needs to be on consecrated ground, not just holy ground. Because everything's holy, right? Anywhere God is, is holy. And God is everywhere, except for Ann Arbor. Um, so there's this thing called, concept called consecrated ground. So namely, we're on consecrated ground here. Uh, we're in the church hall. 
and this was all built as part of the church. So the very ground was consecrated for sacred use, right? Mass and auctions. I'm just kidding. That was funny. I'm sorry. Uh, so a wedding is one of the most, a marriage is one of the most sacred things humans can do. Two humans becoming one is the most holy and remarkable thing most people will ever do. Um, and so it belongs on consecrated ground. Do you get me? Yes. No. Uh, and I, it, this is so embarrassing. I can't remember the others. But I know there were three reasons. And I wrote this article like 10 years ago. And um, I assume it's somewhat like the burying of ashes thing. Um, that it'll have a special place in your heart, but no one else's. Right, that spot where you had the wedding, you know. So it was okay for you to pray the mass outside. Mm -hmm. It wasn't a ma massive wedding. Right, okay. right. Um, and to be clear, I've heard fine arguments for the church loosening that up. I don't know if she ever will. She's busy doing important things like changing the name of RCIA to OCIA. <laughs> that was super important. <laughs> so I think it's like this everywhere but as a guy working for the church and in the church and I think it, it, I, I don't know dad was it like this at GM where you're like that's the thing they're going to address like you look at your bosses and you're like here's 10 problems they pick number 17 and they said we're going all in on this one is it like that it was it like that at GM what did he say? He, he said yes. It depended on, you know, what yeah. department. Yes. And Chuck, where you worked before. Yeah. So I, I don't know. It's a, a, so much of it is, is this, if you ask me. When you're on the ground, when your boot's on the ground, you have a very specific, you have a big view of a narrow field. When you're at the top of the food chain, you have a narrow view of a big field. And I, I think it's that simple. Like, I don't know what I don't know, and that's probably key in this. But I, I continually find myself, like, like, where you're like, what? This is, the, this is what we need to talk about. Really? In what world? But I don't know what I don't know. My world is small. Right? Yeah. Uh, should we pray that God delivers another bat to the Tigers lineup? No, we should pray he heals the bats we have. <laughs> yes. Riley Green's doing great. Riley's batting 300, I think. Does anyone know? Can you check, Uncle Chuck? I know the one that surprised me the most is Carpenter. He's struggling. He's batting, last I knew, he's batting 125. Javi isn't surprising anyone. Uh, you know, in, AJ Hintz said this, right, like a month before the season started. We're going to be hot and cold. It's a very, very young team. This is the youngest team I ever remember seeing, right? And that's how young players work. They're hot and cold. Uh, they have a lot to learn. But they also have a lot of energy. And they're younger so they can make up with speed what they haven't learned yet in technique. You know, like you look at Javi. Javi's never had a good batting technique. But his hands were so fast, and his hand-eye coordination is terrifying, so he could get away with that. Uh, you, you saw it with Miguel. Miguel had the opposite thing. He got so old and so beat up he could barely move, but his uh, technique is flawless, so he could get away with batting into his 40s, you know, which is, uh, Pujols was the same way. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Here we go. Uh, what? Another uh, Ooh, item. Okay, let's jump over. So, so far, guys, we've covered a couple items for our auction. One is the Friends on the Terrace on June 14th, uh, where for $250, that gets two people in for a few hours of cigars, fun, food, uh, Hanging out with and Father human Joe. sacrifice. <laughs> Uh, that's item 300. Then there was like 302, I think, mm -hmm. which was... Um, uh, the parking lot for the homecoming game where we'll give you four spots. Beautiful Enzo's is going to give you a banquet for 20 people. You're going to have pop and everything. It'll be awesome. So that item's up there. Right now we're going to look at item 232 
from Kim Rose Fashions. On there right now. And it's on your screen right now. Now, guys, this is the only place I buy women's clothes. <laughs> I have never bought women's clothes from anywhere except Kim Rose. Uh, Back on you. Don't under, now, there's a word in here that I do not know. Okay. Don't underestimate the power of a bog, like a... A bog bag. It's a... A bog bag, no matter the size. <laughs> this small bag with a cup holder is a great way for you to carry items to the beach and beyond. Um, oh, my gosh. Hey, my brother Paul just texted. He wants tickets to the Friends on the Terrace. Awesome. Oh, right. That's my big brother Paul, who is... Here's the thing. I, I'm I'm biased, right? I love my, I worship my big brother. He is fighting his way back from a stroke and a heart attack, and he's just a machine. He's not a member of this parish, and every year he supports our school as best he can. And him and his wife Pauline are just, oh, praise God for them. Uh, praise God. Thank you, Paul. I love you, big brother. He doesn't like that. He'd rather, you know, like, it's good to see ya. He's a dude. Anyway, so folks, item number three o or three tw- or two three two. Holy cow! I can't make talk with mouth. Item two three two. Kim Rose Fashions is this bog bag that has a. It's a small bag with a cup holder, and you can carry stuff to the beach or anywhere you want. Check it out. Did you say there's a picture of it? We j- we had it on the screen. Groovy. For a couple okay, minutes. so make sure and check that out, guys. It's gonna. It, it's very cool. Uh, my wife has two of them. No, wait. I have two wives, neither of whom have that. That's what I meant to say. Uh, so let's jump back over. How's everybody doing? Great. Okay. Uh, let's see. Uh, okay. Here we are. Oh, I remember. There was one I thought I better get after because they asked about um, basically their priest uh, or their, their ch- shoot. Okay, here it is. I have challenged myself to listen to everything you post in 2024. Oh, my Jesus. You have just shaved every minute off for purgatory. You could murder an innocent person, and God will be like, no, you got credit. You listened to everything out of that loser's mouth. Uh, so you're trying to, you says, uh, thank you, by the way, all kidding aside. As I work towards strengthening my faith and growing in my understanding, my question is around attending a Bible study outside of a Catholic faith. I've been invited by a good friend of a different denomination to attend. She knows and respects that I am Catholic and said this is open to everyone of all faiths. What are your thoughts? I find Bible study group and group seem less frequent in the Catholic faith, so the offer is intriguing. However, I don't want it to deter from my intended growth. Okay, so basically... A guy or gal who's really trying to grow in the faith has been invited to a, a non-Catholic Bible study um, and is wondering, do I do this? Um, on one level, uh, boy, if I could see you face-to-face, it'd help because then I could read your face, right? I'll be super blunt. I've yet to experience a Catholic going to one of these where they weren't trying to convert him or her. Literally. Yeah. 26 years. Never. And it always starts the same way. No, we just want to discuss the faith. At MSU, this was the defining trait of non-Catholic Christian ministers on campus, almost without exception. In my experience, their goal was to get Catholics out of the church and into their church. And they didn't, again, I always say this, I never saw Protestant ministers in the drunk tank with me. I never saw them when I was in the ER uh, for alcohol overdoses. I never saw them at those places. They were always going after the neat and clean Catholic kids. And it drove me insane. And it was always like, I, it was a script. Every year, 50 times a year, I'd have this conversation. Now, Father, my friend, you know, wants me to come to this Bible study. They just want to discuss the faith. They're, they don't care that I'm Catholic. And then a month later, I never see him again. Right? So I have that bitterness maybe slash experience that tells me not once have I experienced someone doing this who didn't have the motive of pulling you from the church. Not only that, but they believe in a doctrine called sola scriptura. 
Namely, they read the Bible radically different than we do. For us, the important thing when we read the Bible is that we recognize it is written in a cultural context as well as a, uh, you know, divinely inspired. Uh, it is absolutely the Word of God. It is of epic and complete importance, but we don't read it like fundamentalists, right? Um, and that's a pretty big difference. The, the easiest way to put it is this. Catholics believe the Bible is the child of the church. Most Protestants believe that the church is the child of the Bible. That's why they keep separating all the time. Because while they might tell you, well, I don't believe in a pope, they kind of do. They think it's them in this regard. And I don't see this cruel. I, 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 I don't know a... So when I disagree with my pastor over an interpretation of a passage, what do we do now? Well, uh, how many Christian churches are in Grand Blank? Holy cow. I'm not kidding. Look it up. And this is just little Grand Blank. Because there's a constant division of how you interpret this passage and how we interpret this passage. All this to say... Um, any time we learn about the Bible and study it is good. But make no mistake, going to a Protestant Bible study means you're going to be looking at the Bible differently than we do. Which, great, if, if you know what I mean? But also know this, I've yet to experience someone who asked that question and really meant anything except I want you in my church. And it's a lot easier than going after an unchurched person. Is that... What do you think of that? I feel yeah. awful saying that. No, it's true. Because here's the key. Uh, I went to, when I was at MSU, I was in civvies. I, I don't know if I ever told you this. I was in civvies at a bookstore, and I had my staff tag on, right? I was guest lecturing in the, I think the history department. And someone approached me and asked me if I wanted to go to a Bible study at a Missouri Synod Lutheran church. And I was like, heck yeah. I love Missouri Synod Lutherans. Oh my gosh. I love those cats. In my head, they knew I was a priest. And I don't know, like, if you've not picked this up, my head goes way too fast. And so, I don't know. I didn't think it through. I just thought, oh, someone saw the Catholic priest and said, come to the Missouri Synod Lutheran Bible study. I went, and this guy smoked it. It was phenomenal. And afterward, he pulled me aside. He was like, wow, you were really into this. Uh, who are you? <laughs> and I'm like, oh, I'm the priest they invited. And he was like, Pardon? Uh, and he and I ended up friends. We did Bible studies together uh, for some of the kids on campus. But even then, he and I had to work hard to figure out what passages we could talk about that we saw the same way. Like Romans. You're going to see Romans the same way as a Missouri Synod Lutheran, right? As a general rule. I mean, there's a... Like, oh, oh, oh. uh, but if you're a Baptist uh, or a non denom you're reading it very, very different than us. Yeah? John 6, 68. Or no, John 6, 60. Unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you can't have life within you. The fundamentalists say, that's figurative. We say, no, that's literal. That's a huge difference. When Jesus says to John, behold your mother, well then, we're the fundamentalists again, and they're not. It, it's... It's a wreck, right? The key is this, and I wish the people trying to convert Catholics would understand this. We can figure this out after we go after the people going to hell, right? But again, we're easy targets. A, there's a billion of us, and most Catholics have no idea what Catholicism is. Uh, and we're neat, clean, easy conversions. So you don't have to get accidentally get your hands dirty. Yeah. <laughs> what? That was, oh, was that bad? Oh, okay. Uh, so, oh my gosh, I see the time. It is. We just want to cover a couple of things if you go to your other page. Okay, you got it, sis. Uh, so what we'll do now, it looks like, is talk about a couple more auction items. Uh, should we talk about the cruise? Yes. Okay, so here's a crazy one for you. Uh, January 5th through the 12th of next year, when our organ pipes are being installed, yes. uh, is the Good News Cruise. So this is a couple's retreat on a cruise ship. Uh, and there are some crazy cool people coming. I, am I wrong about Dolan? I, that's I what believe I Cardinal Dolan is coming because he really wants to learn from me. 
Yeah, it's confirmed. Okay, it's confirmed. He went. He was in fact confirmed because if he wasn't, he couldn't be a bishop. You have to have cardinal. all the other sacraments, <laughs> or a cardinal. That's right. You know why they're called cardinals? Do you yeah. know this? It's the Latin word for the hinge of a door, and they're the hinge that opens the door to the papacy. That's nice. Groovy stuff. Yeah. They're also a baseball team in St. Louis. So join um, us on the Good News Cruise. <coughs> yeah, here's the key. It, it's not cheap. Yeah, true. But it can be. If you get it this way, right, it, you can get it at a lower price than the cost of the cruise if you win this item, right? So this is item, sorry, guys, uh, I don't know. 303. 303. That's the Trinity, a zero, and the Trinity. Yeah. Um, and that's a riot if you haven't gone. And again, what if I'm not married, Father? Find someone. Go to Vegas, get it done, and come on the cruise. <laughs> <laughs> so do you remember at the beginning you were talking about D-Bear, right? Yes. She so funny. laughed as hard at that as I did. Right? My stupid Vegas joke oh, on Wednesday. Okay. That was hilarious. So what else we got? We got some other stuff. Karen's Carpet Max. That's another parishioner-owned business. And this is cool as heck. Yep. So parishioner-owned business, Karen's Carpet Max. If you're looking to refresh a room in your house, you can do it with them. And they're the best. Karen's Carpet Max is the best. You can take home a room refresh package today valued at $3,198. Okay? Um, and uh, that's that's incredible. Are they seeing a picture of it? No. Okay, sorry. Uh, that one's really slick, and that's item 215. Um, and then there's one here. It's like, suppose you're saying, honestly, I just want to donate some money, uh, and I don't want to buy something. Uh, we really need your help on item number one. It's called Fund the Need. Okay? And that's just a general dump your money here because we have needs. Uh, we got needs. Uh, and, guys, seriously, $5. Thank you. Ten dollars. Thank you. Like whatever we can do there helps us a lot. Remember, we can't cost. We can't charge the cost to educate. We wouldn't be able to have anybody here. So we make that up by people's generosity. And if you can help, we would be so grateful. Uh, and uh, we're putting the link up, right? Yes. In case you want to help, or yes. if you don't want to help, we're still putting the link up. We're putting it up. Sorry, I got a little dramatic. It's there. all good. Okay, so I think that wraps us that up is, for today. That's I got an appointment and I got to run off anyway. But uh, thank you so much. Uh, and you know, I don't do you know I don't ask for money or anything like that on this. We don't. Have, uh, but I hope you don't mind. Once a year, we got to do this for our school. We have to. You know, uh, we love our kids. We love our moms and dads. They sacrifice. They work hard. Um, and really. Uh, what did it go? Uh, less than, what is it? Less than 8%, if I'm wrong, I'm very close, of Catholic kids go to Catholic school. 70% of men who are priests went to a Catholic school. Wow. Well. Right? Oh, it, it, there's something there uh, in the idea of daily Catholic education uh, that is not only, of course, frankly, super effective, secular-wise. These kids come out sharp. But there's also a spiritual benefit that tends to translate into priesthood, which we need. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so with that, thank you so much for tuning in. Uh, I will wrap us up now uh, with a prayer, and then I'll see you beautiful people on Wednesday. Salad pray. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Oh, Heavenly Father, thank you for our school, and thank you for Catholic schools everywhere. Thank you for the teachers and the administration and the staff who sweat and bleed and give. Thank you for the moms and dads who sacrifice things they want for things their kids need. Thank you for the communities that help these schools. And, and, and Lord, we ask that you bless our auction tonight. Please help us to raise funds and to do well so that we can raise up the next generation of saints. Thank you for these good people and their good questions. And for anything I got wrong, Lord, please forgive me and fix it. And for anything I got right, thank you, Lord. I'm so glad. 
We ask that you send your Holy Spirit now and touch everyone's heart who's listening to this so that they know your love today and they know how in love with them you are. Your love doesn't give up. Father, you know the people we care about and we worry about. And you know the circumstances in our lives that cause us to fret. We give it all to you, Lord, because we love you and we trust you. And may Almighty God bless you all, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. My Kung Fu is strong. I'll see you beautiful people next week. And until then, frozen peas are my gift to you. Is it over? No, it's never over. Greatest line ever. Well, we're... Some things are, some things are never over.